In what way does our view of God influence our view of humanity? And what are the implications? If there is no God and there is no truth, what are the implications for heaven, hell, eternity? What are the implications for our life today? God, truth, and your future. That's what we'll talk about on today's edition of the program. Stay tuned. In what way does my view of God influence my view of humanity? Hi, Alex McFarland here. So glad you're watching. We've got a great show today. You do not want to miss the next few moments of this program. We're going to talk about God and truth. We've got a very special guest from uh, the Internet and social media, an influencer, and I mean that in a good way, Crusader Gal. And you'll meet Sarah Kane, our very special guest, in just a few moments. But I want to talk a little bit about uh, God. Uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, the famed philosopher, he was a German philosopher and usually is mentioned in a somewhat negative light, but Nietzsche was right on this point. He said, if God is dead, then ultimately humanity is dead. If God dies, ultimately so does humanity. And I would agree. Uh, now, what does that mean? Look, if, if we don't have a creator, uh, then we really don't have an objective foundation for morality and for truth. And in our day here in the 21st century, uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but all around us we see the cheapening of human life. Now for 50 years we've seen no legal protection for the unborn. And more than 72 million uh, babies have been aborted since Roe versus Wade. But we're also seeing in the news now things like green burials and human composting. I mean, things that were just unthinkable to even describe. And it reminds me of uh, in the New Testament how John 10.10 10 says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Here is Satan's M.O. The devil could not kill God. So he's tried to harm and devalue and dehumanize the ones made in God's image. Now, very famously, the uh, writer Dostoevsky said, if God is dead, then anything is permissible. And folks, look, uh, you know, if you watch this program, I talk about having a relationship with Christ and being a born again Christian. And I, I wish that everyone would put their trust in Jesus and be saved. But I would submit to you that whether or not you're a believer, even if you're not a Christian, you have a vested interest in God being real and moral truth being lived out. Because look, when you erase God from the conversation and you close scripture and there is no truth and there are no moral boundaries, things get dark, dangerous, and deadly really quickly. And we're seeing that all around us. And so I think about this, folks. God is real. We talk about on this program that God, scripture, Jesus Christ are, are proven true by compelling lines of evidence. And again, uh, our core message is that you would have a relationship with Christ. But in just a moment, when we come back, we're going to talk with Sarah Kane, the crusader gal, and we're going to talk about the implications for human life. If we as a culture largely rule out God and in education and government, we, we have no moral boundaries. And we say that truth is fluid and morality is whatever I define it to be. Folks, that jeopardizes all of us, really. And so, Time Magazine in April 1966 said God is dead. Uh, if God is dead, Nietzsche was right, then man will die as well. Fortunately, God is alive. And in the acknowledgement of God, we can find not only life, fulfillment, but cultural stability and rights and prosperity for all. When we come back, we're going to talk with a very special guest. We'll continue this conversation, the overlap between our view of God and our view of humanity. Stay tuned. The Alex McFarland program is back right after this. Every daughter knows that her father is the most important man in her life. He is her first love. But her father doesn't know it 
because dads are maligned and marginalized today. Well, I have an answer for dads, my strong father's strong daughter's masterclass. It's a series of online videos I created to show fathers exactly what they can do to have better, closer relationships with their daughters. And men have told me that it's transformational in their relationships with their daughters. So no matter what your daughter's age, if you're a dad who needs encouragement and help, check out my Strong Fathers, Strong Daughters Masterclass. You can only find it on meekerparenting.com. Welcome back to the program. We're talking about God and the implications of what we believe about God relative to humanity, moral truth. By the way, my book, The Ten Most Common Objections to Christianity and How to Effectively Answer Them, we talk about issues like how do we know God exists? What about morality and objective moral truth, not just subjective preferences? And you can find this in all of my books at my own website, which is alexmcfarland.com or at booksellers everywhere. Well, right now, I'm very excited to bring on our guest, uh, Sarah Kane. She's known online and in the social media world as Crusader Gal. And her website is crusadergal.com. Right, Sarah? That's right. Well, I want to say welcome to the program. Thanks for being here. Thank you. And more importantly, thank you for what you're doing to proclaim truth in our culture. I appreciate that. I'm, I'm doing my best. Yeah, well, you're doing a great job. And I want to commend you, and I don't say this lightly. Um, you're a good writer. I love your articles, and I want you, uh, before we talk about God and humanity, uh, tell people about your website. Who is Crusader Gal, and what will they find when they go to your website? Well, when you, you come to my website, when you look at all of my work, what you generally see is an attempt to remind people of the need to put Christ back into our society. We've tried to sort of build a society without Christ, try to sort of like divorce ourselves from him, build a secular world. And we see around us this problem of trying to build a world without any sort of rational foundation. We're trying to build it on a source of relativism. And we're here in a world where people can't distinguish between a man and a woman anymore. Yeah. And so what I'm trying to do in my work is remind people of that, that foundation and why it's connected to what we see going on around us as everything seems like it's falling apart. It seems like the world is burning. And in a very real sense, it's going to be that way until people are willing to stand on this solid foundation and say, you know, there's an objective truth. There are, there's a right and there's a wrong. And we need to start speaking about it because there's so many people who are afraid that they might offend somebody and therefore they can't speak truth. And we need to do better than that. And we can and we should. Well, I, already I've learned a lot, and I, I want to say um, I thank God for you because you're, um, from my perspective, you're, you're a young adult, and you've got wisdom beyond your years, and I mean that as a compliment, and your, you. your writing is good. I want to hear a little bit about your, your story because uh, I detect you don't have the Bible Belt accent that most of us around here do. Um, uh, where does that lovely accent come from? Uh, I, I grew up in northern England in a place called Sheffield, yes, okay. which is far from the Bible Belt in so many different ways. You know, <laughs> yeah. because it's, a, it's a place where, honestly, it's socially unacceptable to be Christian. Because really? if you're raised there, you're raised in an environment of atheism and of a staunch type of atheism. The, well, we're the reasonable people. You know, how can you question us as the people who don't believe in, in that thing in the sky? Yeah. You know, that's the environment in which I was raised. Very different to over here. But it's also a culture that is, is dying at a much faster rate. And I think there's a connection there. Yeah, it, it does seem like um, Europe and, and Britain, if, if you go there, um, we Americans often think of England as this um, seat of Christianity, and in the 18th and 19th centuries, world missions emanated. You know, the Wesleys, and there's a, an iconic figure, Charles Spurgeon, who was a great preacher in London. So l let me ask you this. Um, how did this happen from what we would call Christendom right. and Britain being such a, a force for the gospel, but now you're saying so uh, full of atheism, how did that It take does place? seem like around the time of World War II was sort of a turning point in the society in a very major way, where before World War II, you had a much more Christian society. Yes, it was part of Christendom, and that goes way back. 
but after that, there was an attempt to sort of rebuild the society on utilitarian terms, mm -hmm. right? That we can, by our own strength and belief in science and reason, we can do it. And I think that there was something more than that. I think it was a contempt. I think it was a sense of, of anger toward God. That, that we believed in God and yet the bombs, you know, fell anyway, and therefore we're going to move away from Him. And it's 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 so backward to think of things in those terms, but that's what they did, and I think mm -hmm. that that happened in almost a generational sense. Mm -hmm. And then they embraced this: we can we can do better, we can build on our own, and the results really haven't been good. Uh, yeah, and you know there were some atheists in the 20th century. Um, I know we in Christian worldview and apologetics, we talk about a lot of dead people, but it's because they have influences. You know, um, here in America, there was Bertrand Russell who wrote a very famous book, Why I Am Not a Christian. And it was largely about what we would call the problem of evil, you know. Uh, and then in Britain, there was another, uh, Anthony Flew, that was an atheist. And uh, so even though the, these guys might have only been influential 50, 60 years ago, uh, they had an influence. And these, these pop-level atheists that say, well, bad stuff happens, therefore there is no God, that has a trickle-down effect, and I think we're seeing that in our day, aren't we? I, I do think so. And when you, you look around us, and I know you, you mentioned this in the outset, but the way that we, we in fact, treat our dead, the way that we, we're treating our, our living isn't respectful of the dignity of the human person. And that's one of these manifestations that you were talking about in the world around us. So, you know, with the whole treating of our dead, you've got human composting is, is not the way that you treat somebody who is made in the image and likeness of God, you know, who was who made representative of him, who is one of his children yeah. and who matters to us. You know, I wrote an article a few months ago, actually, about a, an autopsy that was conducted over in Portland. It was an autopsy done for entertainment. They sold $500 a ticket, Alex, to come and sit you know, feet away from somebody being dissected. That man who was being di dissected, he was a guy named David Saunders. He was a World War II veteran. He gave his body to science, you know, as like a, a final sacrifice to the world he was leaving behind. And that's how that world treated him in return. You know, they, they grieved his wife who found out about it, his widow who found out about it. That is, is the world that we're inhabiting. And if God, if God is nothing, if God is to be discarded as our atheist world says so, there's nothing wrong with that. But mm. I think everybody who hears that, you know, we, we know it intrinsically mm -hmm. that that is incredibly wrong. Uh, I agree. I agree. And like we said at the beginning of the program, how we view man is uh, an outgrowth of how we view God. Right. And and I, I applaud you. I applaud you in the strongest possible terms for speaking about this. Um, as you and I were prepping, there was another article about um, in on the West Coast disposing of human remains in a vat of acid. Right, Just, alkaline hydrosis. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Just as if the person never existed. Yes. Yes. To, to, to completely, I guess, reduce them. In its sense of, it's like human erasure. I guess, and it's yeah. so symbolic. It's, it's the it? ultimate form of canceling, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You cease to exist. Yes. Um, and we, we cease to, in some sense, remember you and have a place to, to veneer you. And it's just the human body has, has that worth. It was a, it was a vessel yes. of that person's spirit. Yeah. And, and then we, we take it and we discard of it like trash, or in some sense, maybe worse than trash. Mm -hmm. and, and this is the, the direction that we're going. And it's all under the under the veneer of environmentalism, remember they called it green burial? Yeah, green burial, yeah. Yeah. And, and, but isn't this something, um, speak on this if you would, just um, again, I mean, there was so much to take in as I was prepping for the show. One scientist said that we need to plan for responsible extinction of the human race. In other words, we owe it to the planet for we humans to disappear. And the denigration of humans very often is parallel with the worship of the world. It's just the, the absolute inverse of what God the Creator intended. And it's paganism throughout history, right? Because you have this sort of worship of nature, not in the sense of, oh, there's grass, but in the sense of nature as a, as a deity in and of itself, right? Yes. And they even give it various names like Gaia and so on, as you, as you see, exactly. amongst those who worship it today. But that's what it is. It's this inversion of, it's supposed to be, you know, man has dominion over beast and over nature, which doesn't to say that we should, you know, treat it with respect, but rather that 
that's our natural rightful order of things. And instead, this, this sort of paganism this becomes very worldly in a very material sense. It's, it's let's worship these, these parts of the world instead of man. And mm. we see, uh, and then you end up with justifications for all kinds of evil mm -hmm. because you don't see man as worthy of respect in and of himself. Mm -hmm. And then it's, well, why can't we just eliminate individuals because they're inconvenient? And that ties us right in to one of, honestly, the most common reasons for abortion today. Oh, right? exactly. Right? It's, it's, I don't have the money right now, or I have this career that I'm pursuing. And, and yeah, I get that this is one of the most difficult decisions that women make, and I think we should be supporting them and providing financial aid to make it easier for them to take their children and have them. But we have to get back down to the, to the root of the issue, which is, can you eliminate a, a human being because they're inconvenient? Mm. Wow. Uh, great question. And that was what I was going to ask you was, you know, what are the implications for human rights? You know, because... You know, British common law going back a thousand years and certainly our own government uh, and Bill of Rights says, look, you're a person, you're made in God's image, you have worth, value, dignity because you're a human being. Um, not because of how much money you may or may not have, but every human being is a person of intrinsic value and worth. If we push that aside, Sarah, what are the implications for our rights and our security even today? Well, you have none. You have none. And, and that ties in with abortion because the abortion is the abolition of every human right. So if you decide that you can eliminate an individual on the basis of him being inconvenient or expensive or you know, coming in in some strange circumstance or, or what have you, well, then you eliminate every right. And for example, we look back throughout our history at various different medically accepted policies as evil today. And they were. Forced sterilization would be one of them. These forced lobotomies that we gave to people who we considered to be um, objectionable. Okay, these were, were evils and pretty much everybody today agrees that they were, mm -hmm. okay? That's because we were moving those people's rights, their, their right to exist, their right to procreate, their right to make their own decisions and to live autonomously. Well, what about the child that we eliminate? We take away all of those same rights Mm -hmm. And it's the very same thing. If you remove the dignity of man, of the individual man, not necessarily the collective, because he has worth even if he's just one. Mm -hmm. you know, if you eliminate that, there's nothing else upon which we can stand. Uh, 1943, one of my favorite Brits, C.S. Lewis, yes. Clive Staples Lewis, he wrote a book called The Abolition of Man, right. which is, we quote that book a lot on this program. Uh, but it talks about the relationship between God and moral truth. But Lewis said, like so many others, like Nietzsche, even though Nietzsche wasn't a Christian, but look, if we abolish God, we've abolished humanity. Yes. And I think that was very prophetic that Lewis would point that out. Yeah, uh, undeniably. And what's amazing is that he said it back then and we, we sit here today, and now it seems a lot more clear because now we've been trying to build various societies, especially over in Europe, uh, without God. And they're in, a, they're in a situation where they also don't have a, an understanding of, of even the basic rights that we he, do here in the United States, like the right to free expression and free speech and why that's important. That's been vanquished. These were things that once in England were considered to be especially important, you know, but now not so much. But they were back when it was a Christian society. Mm -hmm. When as a, as a Christian society, they said, okay, so each human being has these values, has this, this worth. And now it's like, well, for the good of the collective, for the good of the group, we have to silence individuals and arrest them. And in fact, there are thousands of people who mm -hmm. are arrested in England every year for things that they say on Twitter or Facebook and so on. Mm -hmm. That's obscene. Mm -hmm. And yet it's also, it, it, it's regular. Yeah. Um, I, I want to talk about this crusader gal. Yes. Um, first of all, I want to commend you. I think it's real. I don't know if you intended this, but the word gal, G-A-L. Uh -huh. Uh, here in America, in woke 21st century America, if you refer to a female as a gal, oh my goodness, they, they will have an aneurysm. Yes. But you call yourself crusader gal. I do. And I reject that entire woke culture and everything that it stands for. So uh, they, can, they can scream. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, so tell us about um, what you're doing and um, what people will find when they go to your websites. Well, I do both writings and video. Mm -hmm. You know, so I kind of put 
try to provide something for everybody, but it's all an attempt to get people to join me in standing up for what is right and what is true. Yeah. And I call myself the Crusader Gal as that reminder back to the Crusades, because nowadays there's so much people who are so many people who are ashamed seemingly of the Crusades, because they don't have a full understanding of the context exactly. in which they took place. Exactly. But there were 400 years of aggression, of just absolute barbarism before those Crusades ever took place, and that we sort of owe Christendom to the fact those people were willing to lay down their lives, you know, to, to, to fight for this higher ideal for God. Mm. And that's the thing. This was a time in which people were willing, Alex. Mm. They were willing to do everything and anything and to give their very lives for God and for what, what they believed to be right. And now people are afraid to just speak. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm asking for people is speak what is true because the very beginning, the very foundation, that's what we need. And we have generations of young people who haven't even heard what the truth is yeah. because so many people are afraid of offending somebody. You know, the, God is not offensive. You know, God is simply true. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's right. And, and you know what? The, the unexamined uh, worldview leaves people just in darkness. Right. Um, wouldn't you agree, like the Christian faith, and by the way, folks, I want to say this, um, that the Christian faith can certainly well stand up to any honest scrutiny. Uh, you know, it, I, I think the atheistic or secular world, sometimes they believe that Christians just blindly well, we just believe things, you know. But some of the most rigorously uh, rational thinkers have wrestled with truth, wrestled with historical evidence, uh, processed scripture, and subjected the Christian faith to the most thorough, meticulous analysis. And they come away and they say, God is real. This, this is justifiable. Jesus Christ lived. He rose. There is moral truth. The Christian worldview makes rational sense. Yes. And what you're doing, Sarah, and I applaud it, you are calling people to examine what they believe. Yes. And I think we need more of it. I don't we think do. we need a, a blind acceptance. We need you know, thorough reason and examination to the degree that you should be able to tell your friends and explain, explain your faith because we can. You know, our faith is a reasoned faith. It's, it's amazing. And it's just, and there are so many people throughout the past. You mentioned them earlier. There are people throughout the past who have written and who have analyzed and thought this through. And we can look back at their writings and it's inspirational. There are people who have given, who have given everything to defend our faith. Give us your website one more time. It is crusadergal.com. Crusadergal.com. Folks, a uh, website and a, a voice that I would urge you to to follow. Well, we've got to pull away and we'll come back and talk more in a final thought about the relationship between God and humanity. On this edition of the Alex McFarland Show, you can watch again at alexmcfarland.com. Stay tuned. We're back right after this. This is John. He's 21. He's never met Jesus. It's possible he never will. He never went to church. His mom doesn't trust them. How do you change his future? So let's find his public school and establish a Bible club down the hall. There, someone introduces him to Jesus, who takes his life in a new direction. John's so excited, he tells his friends, one of them comes to Christ. And it all began in a public school good news club. Welcome back. I want to thank my guest, Sarah Kane, the Crusader gal, and I'm sure you'll want to re-watch. There was so much rich content there. I'm sure you'll want to listen again because there's a lot to learn. But as we wrap up this conversation about God and humanity, I want to reference Jeremiah chapter 19 in the Old Testament because uh, very famously, the prophet Jeremiah talked about uh, God is the potter and we are the clay. You know, God created Adam from the dust of the ground. So that's a very appropriate metaphor that God fashioned us. Uh, human beings are made in the image of God. You are made in God's image. And in the eyes of God, you have worth and value and the Lord loves you very much. But God loves us so much that he doesn't just tell us what we want to hear God tells us what we need to hear. Now, the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 19, God told Jeremiah to do something before the leaders of Israel because they had turned away from God and they were having a lot of chaos. God told Jeremiah, take an earthen flask, a clay pot, and let everybody watch you smash it on the ground. Uh, why? Uh, because look, if you take away the potter, you're going to have damage to the clay. 
And if we rule out God the Creator, God the Sovereign Lord of the world, God the Savior of our own lives, just like the clay vessel was smashed into pieces, we will be broken. Our society is unraveling, our world is broken, and our lives are shattered if we rule out God, the, the, the foundation of truth and morality. So our call to you and Sarah Kane, the crusader gal, is look, God is not the problem. God is the solution. God is the answer. And our prayer is that you would know Christ and you would make him known. Jesus is as close by as a prayer. And any way that we can help you stand strong for truth, we're here to help you do that. I just returned from a conference at The Cove, and it was absolutely breathtaking in every way. The mountain views, the tranquil areas within the woods, and just being alone with God. Mornings spent watching the sunrise from a rocking chair with coffee in one hand and my Bible in the other. Evenings spent reflecting on the incredible spiritual teaching. It's the embodiment of peacefulness. Come and experience The Cove for yourself. I want to say a big thank you to all of our partners who pray for this program. You know, we do events, publishing, broadcasting, and people from throughout North America are writing, and they say that the newsletters encourage them, and the programs instruct and equip them, and people are also supporting financially. And for all who support, we give a very heartfelt thank you, because God is using this, and people are coming to Christ, and young people are telling us that they feel confident to speak up to their friends about the gospel and about moral truth. And so we are making a difference, and I give God the glory, and I thank you. But I want to ask you to do a couple of things. For for one thing, go to my website, alexmcfarland.com. Go to my website. You'll see that we've got some special events coming up. The Cove, the Billy Graham Training Center in Western North Carolina. I'll be there July 7 through 9, teaching through 2 Peter. The theme is Thriving Till He Comes. Then uh, April 21 through 23 in Tennessee, near Nashville, it's Paris, Tennessee, we've got one of our national conferences, Truth for a New Generation. And the theme is this, now listen to this, Truth Matters, Confronting the Issues that Will Shape Our Future. You can go to that website, which is truthforanewgeneration.com, truth, F-O-R, truthforanewgeneration.com. At the Paris, Tennessee event in April will be Abe Hamilton III, Will and Mickey Addison, Bert Harper, Carl Kirby from Reasons for Hope, and I'll be there. And folks, you don't want to miss it because we are in our events, publishing and broadcasting. We are confronting the issues that will shape our future. Please pray, promote, plan to attend. And let me encourage you, you can give securely online at alexmcfarland.com or you can write to us, P.O. Box 485, Pleasant Garden, North Carolina, 27313. But please join us by financially supporting as we call our nation and world back to Christ.